Now the Stoics comprised, as did the Epicureans, an enduring school that lasted for centuries. Uh, first in Greece and then later in Rome. Uh, their founder was Zeno. This is a different Zeno from the one that couldn't walk across the room, <laughs> whose dates are 340 to 265 BC, and he had several uh, Greek disciples. I'll mention the names, but I won't bother you with the dates or the spellings because very few people have ever heard of them. Cleanthes, Chrysippus, Posidonius. Uh, uh, you can just ignore that. Um, uh, Zeno lectured from a porch, <coughs> and since the Greek for porch is stoa, uh, he became called the porch philosopher, and thus the word stoic. In Rome, uh, when the current of civilization shifted there, stoicism was a highly influential philosophy, much more so than Epicureanism ever became. Uh, you undoubtedly heard of Cicero and Seneca, both of whom, although they're not pure stoics, are deeply influenced by stoicism. The two most famous Roman Stoics are Epictetus, the slave, who was born around the mid-first century AD, and Marcus Aurelius, the emperor of Rome, who was second century AD. And it's often said that this indicates the universal appeal of Stoicism in Rome. If a lowly slave and the mighty emperor both uh, were the leading lights in Rome of the same philosophy. Now, because it lasted so many hundreds of years, Stoicism passed through various phases, altering its doctrines in various ways, and it's usual to divide it into early, middle, and late Stoicism, but that is unimportant for our purposes. We will concentrate on some general doctrines common as tendencies and in various forms to most of the Stoics, and we'll particularly interested in the later Stoics as one of the main transitions to Christianity. The early Stoics, I might mention, the Greek ones, were materialists in regard to the gods and the soul, somewhat in the manner that the atomists were. But as Stoicism developed, it became progressively more dualistic, more Platonist, more uh, this world versus another world, the soul versus the body, and more emphasizing immortality. That was a progressive tendency in Stoicism. Now, the goal of the Stoics was salvation, serenity, peace of mind to the individual in a torn world. Uh, they were influenced in this respect not only by the general temper of the times, but also by a particular school which grew out of Socrates' ethical teachings, uh, which I haven't mentioned in this course so far, the school called the Cynics, the capital C, the most famous of whom, of course, is Diogenes, you know, the one with the lamp that went around looking for an honest man. Socrates had uh, taught, if you recall, that external circumstances cannot harm the really good man. What counts in life is your internal state, not your external possessions or the circumstances of society. Well, the cynics proceeded to develop this point beyond anything that Socrates himself had said or implied. They concluded that you should be entirely indifferent to your existential fortune, that you should scorn all social amenities, fancy clothes, material goods, even ordinary civilized manners. Diogenes uh, was in a, in a bathtub uh, out in the street, dressed very sloppily. In effect, go back to nature and live like an animal, like a dog, you see, and thus the name cynic from Sunos, which is Greek for dog. Cynic literally means the dog philosopher. And they dressed very shabbily. They scorned all the amenities. They were, in effect, the first hippies in the West. Now, in their desire for peace of mind and their scorn for external things, the Stoics are, in part, an outgrowth of this earlier cynicism. And uh, in this respect, they are also, of course, similar to Epicurus in their overall thrust of their viewpoint. But they did not believe that Epicurus was independent enough of reality because he still wanted things from this world. He still wanted pleasure, his garden, his friends, enough wealth for leisure, etc. The Stoic viewpoint was that we must adopt the same general line as Epicurus, but more consistently. More consistently. We must stop valuing anything in the external world or in any way de dependent on the external world. We must stop valuing pleasure, so hedonism is out, even the negative hedonism of Epicurus. We must stop valuing friends. We must stop valuing even life. And some of them went so far as to recommend suicide on the grounds that nothing, including life, was of value. But this, I should say, is an extreme viewpoint and did not attract 
a large posterity. <laughs> what we must do, they said, is achieve utter insensibility, or as it is in Greek, apathy, that is to say, the absence of feeling, uh, 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 which comes out in English as apathy, <coughs> non-emotion. Emotions for them are a disease, an aberration, any emotion, emotion as such. And emotions must be obliterated across the board. The ideal stoic is the man who hears that his wife was just run over and or that he's just won a $3 million lottery and or that he just got a new toothbrush with exactly the same reaction. Namely, that's nice or that's too bad, but perfectly calm reaction. They tell the story of Epictetus. I don't know whether it's true, but it illustrates the viewpoint. He was the slave, of course, and that his master was apparently a sadist, and one day was twisting Epicurus, I think it was his leg. And Epictetus is supposed to have said to him very, very calmly, if you continue to twist my leg, your bone is going to break. And the, um, the master continued to twist, and at a certain point there was a grinding noise and a crack as the bone broke. And Epictetus is alleged to have looked at him without turning a hair and said, I told you it was going to break. <laughs> now, when you reach this stage, you see, nothing in the world can touch you. This is salvation. Now, the question is how to achieve this state. And what then should you do once you've reached it? <laughs> On what basis would you then take any action at all? There could no longer be any advantage to you in seeking any particular goal because you're in a state of apathy, having abandoned all values. Well, the answers to all these questions require us to understand the nature of the universe and see man's place in it. And if you gain this knowledge, you can attain apathy and know on what basis to act. So we turn then to the Stoic view of the nature of the universe, in other words, the metaphysics of the Stoics. Now, if Epicurus is a development from atomism, Stoicism is a development from Platonism. And the best way to approach their metaphysics is via the argument from design, as it's called, design, a venerable argument for the existence of God on which the metaphysics of the Stoics ultimately rests. This argument was not originated by the Stoics. It goes back all the way to Anaxagoras. You remember the man with the little seeds? And, of course, it's uh, in many, many places implied and all but explicitly stated in Plato himself. But the Stoics are the first school to make this argument fundamental to their metaphysics. The argument from design goes like this. Look at the universe. Look how orderly, lawful, regular it is. Look how complex, and yet look at the magnificent harmony of all of the various parts, all fitting into a smoothly functioning whole. Look at the purposiveness of all the parts, all meshing together to achieve an overall design. Now, such obvious perfection and design in the universe implies a designer a powerful cosmic soul or intelligence which runs the universe for some ultimate purpose, which keeps all things orderly and lawful as a part of its purpose. And therefore, there must be such a cosmic intelligence, namely God. That's the argument in design. Now, I assume I interject here that you know the error of this argument uh, in essence, it assumes that uh, existence left to its own devices in the absence of a designing mind would run wild and become chaos. Uh, in other words, the argument fails to recognize that order, a law, a regularity means the law of cause and effect. And that the law of cause and effect is simply a corollary of the law of identity, which is inherent in existence as such. And therefore, there's no such thing as a possibility of a disorderly existence. <clears throat> metaphysically, and consequently, there is no need for a god to keep existence uh, in line. A as A is quite sufficient. As to the idea that uh, everything has a purpose, which is a different concept from everything obeys law, 
Uh, you may ask, what was the Stoic reasoning behind this? In general, as derivative philosophers, the Stoics simply accepted the overall teleological viewpoint of Plato and Aristotle. And, of course, purpose does imply some sort of conscious agent which has the purpose. It's a very different concept from law, which does not imply uh, a conscious agent. And that is why the argument from design is frequently called the teleological argument for the existence of God, from telos, the Greek for purpose. This argument, I may say, appears in the Reader's Digest every six months or a year <laughs> under the title, 12 Reasons Why a Scientist Believes in God. <laughs> in any case, the Stoics accepted this argument as a proof of God. They did not, however, believe that God is a being existing separately in another world, in another dimension the way we are accustomed to think of God from the point of view of Judaism or uh, Christianity. They took instead the uh, analogy to the human body, the human being. Just as the soul of the human being is not outside the body, controlling it from another realm, but is within the, the body, controlling it from inside and making its behavior ordered. So they said with the universe as a whole. God, the controlling agent of the universe, is also within the universe. We should think of him as the soul of the universe as a whole. The world soul, you see. And uh, forming with the matter of the universe a single cosmic living being. A single indivisible entity. Now you see, this is essentially the standard religious viewpoint but the attempt to give a more naturalistic account of God, trying to base it, uh, base the view of the God's relation to the world on the model of the soul-body relation, which we can directly observe here on Earth. Now, this sort of view is called pantheism. From the Greek pan, meaning all, and theos, God. The universe as a whole is matter infused with a semi-personal omnipresent mind or soul guiding everything for the best. And that totality is, they sometimes refer to it as the cosmic animal. And uh, they give it a whole bunch of different names. Sometimes they call it God or nature or Zeus or reason or providence. Uh, there's a whole string of names. Now, two attributes of this animal, that is to say of the universe or of God, whatever you want to call it, should be noted here. First, <clears throat> as already suggested, it is teleological through and through. Everything happens for the best, for a purpose of God's. This is inherent in the argument from design. Uh, the world is designed and kept orderly by God for some purpose or goal of his. Uh, and of course, this point, as I suggested, the Stoics generally took over the overall teleology from Plato and Aristotle. I should say, though, that the Stoic teleology tended to be much cruder than either Plato's or Aristotle's. Plato had his uh, comparatively sophisticated form of the good toward which everything aspires. And Aristotle had his metaphysical self-realizationism. For the Stoics, however, generally they had an anthropomorphic view of teleology. In other words, the purpose of everything, many of them said, at least part of the time, was somehow man's welfare. So, for instance, you get the kind of, you know, crude, low-level teleology. Why are there diseases? To combat population growth. Why are there bed bugs? To get us up in the morning. <laughs> Why do melon have ribs so we can apportion the shares equally, etc.? Now, this is what you call a primitive teleology. And a second attribute of the divine animal. Rigid determinism. Now, the Stoics agreed with Epicurus that universal cause and effect means rigid determinism. They simply took the other side of the conclusion. They said there is rigid cause and effect, and therefore everything is determined. There is no such thing as free will anywhere in the universe, neither in man nor in God. Everything that happens is an inevitable expression of God's nature. He cannot arbitrarily will 
or choose anything. He's not a Christian God or a Jewish God. He's a Stoic God. Everything, therefore, is fixed from all eternity. <clears throat> Indeed, for the Stoics, the universe goes through rigidly fixed cycles. Uh, they were influenced in part here by their reading of Heraclitus, and they held that at one time the universe was a huge fire, sometimes called the Great Bonfire with a capital G and B. And then, following immutable laws, it goes through various stages of development, worlds are formed, and so on. And then, since after all, the universe is finite, in their view, there's only so many elements, at a certain point, the original combination must be reached again. The original state must be reached again. In other words, we have another fire, a great bonfire. And then we go around the cycle the next time. Since the same ingredients exist following the same laws, we must go through the identical development. It's like a deck of cards shuffled according to an inexorable law. You keep going through cycles, each step repeated in the same order identically each time. So, for instance, on this view, you have, whether you remember it or not, and obviously the Stoics didn't think you would, you have had this lecture on the Stoics an infinite number of times already. You came to uh, the Hilton every Thursday an infinite number of times, and you will do it an infinite number of times in the future. I will give the identical lecture, you will ask the identical questions. I sometimes wonder why it is that, um, that we have to go through it so many times, but uh, you see the idea is everything comes back eternally. This is known as the doctrine of eternal return, and it simply is a dramatic way of emphasizing the rigid, inexorable rule of destiny. I should say that this doctrine of eternal return or eternal recurrence was picked up by Nietzsche, among other philosophers, and subscribed to by several philosophers uh, much later. Now, you might wonder at this point, well, how can you have an ethics at all if you hold such a doctrine? How can you say what people should do or shouldn't do if everything is inevitable and they do what they have to do? Well, that is a problem. It is called the problem of freedom. And the problem is, if there isn't any, <laughs> how can you have ethics? <clears throat> how can you prescribe how men should behave? How can you hold them responsible? How can you praise them or blame them? Now, this is a problem that the Stoics struggled with desperately, but unsuccessfully. We will note the same problem under Christianity, which had, had it in spades, and also struggled desperately with. <laughs> in general, this is a problem for any deterministic metaphysics and is, in fact, insoluble on such a metaphysics. Though determinists from the time of the Stoics to the present have made endless attempts to solve this problem and to reconcile determinism with morality. If you're interested in the typical modern attempt to do so, I'll be glad to explain that in the question period. Well then, to summarize the metaphysics of the Stoics, it's got three central concepts which you can put in any order you want. A teleological deterministic pantheism, a pantheistic deterministic teleology, a teleological pantheism, you get it. <laughs> As to the Stoic epistemology, I will mention simply in a sentence or so two points of some importance for later philosophy. First, the later Roman Stoics in particular emphasized that man was born with certain innate ideas as a God-given cognitive endowment to enable us, in effect, to start the process of acquiring knowledge. After all, your mind is a part of God since God is everything. And as such, it contains at birth, they thought, at least some of God's ideas. Although many of the Stoics also, being eclectic on this type of issue, emphasized the role of the senses in a more Aristotelian manner. But insofar as they advocated innate ideas, the Stoics continued and transmitted the Platonist, rationalist epistemology, and they were thus one of the main links on this issue between Plato and the rationalists of the modern era. And the second point I'll mention briefly of their epistemology. In answer to the question, when can you claim absolute certainty? 
the Stoics came up with the so-called doctrine of irresistibility, <coughs> which amounts, uh, stripped of its fancy language, to the following. In the process of seeking an answer to some question, you should raise, consider, answer all possible doubts until at a certain point you will suddenly see in an incontestable insight, in an irresistible insight, that the idea in question is unanswerable, is true. <clears throat> and such an irresistible insight they described as one which was, quote, clear and distinct, unquote. Now I simply ask you to remember the terms clear and distinct. <clears throat> <clears throat> You'll see what happens to this issue when we get to Descartes, who in many ways is influenced by the Stoics. I think you can see that this is a pretty feeble epistemology. And uh, many later Stoics gave up under the onslaught of the skeptics and said, well, I guess we never can be certain of any truth, only achieve probability. All right, now let's turn to the Stoic ethics. And first, their view of man. What is man on this philosophy? Well, if everything is God, if God is all that exists, uh, then a man is only a part or a piece of God. In Epictetus' phrase, man is a, quote, fragment torn from God. His soul is a part of the world soul. His body is a part of the world body. He is not, and this is the crucial point, any longer to be viewed as an autonomous creature, as a separate individual, as an individual metaphysically on his own, owning himself, without allegiance to anything but himself. That latter was the view that Aristotle had held, that Epicurus had held. It was not, of course, the view that Plato had held, and in this respect also the Stoics reflect a definite Platonic legacy. Man is, in their terms, to be viewed strictly as a part of a larger whole, as a part of God, temporarily severed from God, but still only a part of God, owing allegiance to God, in other words, to the whole of which he's only a part. And we know that the universe, or God, has a plan, a purpose, that man is on earth in accordance with God's plan, that he has a role assigned to him in that plan. We know, therefore, that man has obligations imposed on him by the fact of not being a metaphysically autonomous entity, the fact of being only a part of a wider whole. In a word, man has duties which he must obey. Not for reward, <coughs> for gain, for pleasure, for any personal advantage, but strictly because they are his duties. Thus, for the first time, we get an avowed morality of duty, in stark contrast to the approach of Aristotle, or Epicurus, uh, or even Plato much of the time. Of course, it's implicit in Plato, but to a good extent, Plato held that virtues are to be practiced because they lead to happiness, fulfillment, because some advantage accrues to you. The Stoics, however, on the basis of their metaphysics of pantheism and their view that it's hopeless to try to achieve any values in life, abandon the traditional Greek approach to morality and instead make morality an issue of doing what's right because it's right. Doing your duty because it's your duty, period, regardless of any advantages or disadvantages, regardless of its effects on you. A duty morality is essentially any morality which separates virtues from values or actions from rewards. And it is, of course, the antithesis of the objectivist approach to morality. If you will notice, in Galt's speech, virtue is defined as the action by means of which one attains value. And that very definition, of course, effaces the possibility of a duty approach to ethics. In this respect, the Stoics are one of the main sources of what Kant later took uh, over and blew up into astronomic proportions. Now, I'll give you a brief quote from Marcus Aurelius on this point. Quote, <clears throat> When thou hast done well to another, and another has fared well at thy hands, why go on like the foolish to look for a third thing besides, that is, the credit 
of having done well, or some return for it. Is not it enough that thou hast done something in accordance with thy nature? Seekest thou a recompense for it? As though the eye should claim a reward for seeing, or the feet for walking. For just as these latter were made for their special work, and by carrying this out, they come fully into their own, so also man, formed as he is by nature for benefiting others, when he has acted as benefactor uh, for the general welfare, has done what he was constituted for, and has what is his. You see, you don't ask any more, therefore, unquote. What is in it for me to be moral? That is a wrong approach. To be moral is to do your duty. Just as the eye doesn't say, what is in it for me to see? To be an eye is to see, like it or lump it. Now, I think you can grasp how the road is being paved for Christianity, where ethics becomes a matter of following commandments because God commanded them, period. Of course, the Stoics are not Christians. They're pagans. They believe that you can establish your duties rationally, not by revelation, but the basic duty theme nevertheless appears in them. And it is, you see, their answer to the question, on what basis should you act once you've abandoned personal values? And the answer is, on duty. <clears throat> now, I should mention that as Greeks, the Stoics were not consistent in their duty approach to morality. <coughs> It was common for them, part of the time, to advocate duty as an end in itself, regardless of any advantages that it brought, and part of the time to, to declare that the justification of doing your duty is the advantages it brings to you personally. For instance, inner tranquility, peace of mind, a sense of moral virtue, happiness. In this respect, there is not too much difference between the Stoics and Plato, insofar as their uh, uh, approach to morality is distinctive. Both advocate placing something above your own happiness, such as sacrifice, duty, etc. But insofar as they're both Greek, neither ever lost the appreciation in some form of individual happiness as the ultimate goal of morality. So neither Platonism nor Stoicism is consistent on this point, and you should know this for historical accuracy. I may say the same is true of Christianity. Uh, which preaches that you should follow God's commandments because he commanded them, regardless of any advantage to you, which is a purely duty approach, and yet promises otherworldly happiness for eternity if you do so, which is a legacy of the Greek idea that a reward is the justification of virtue, which was carried over by Christianity into a supernatural form. A completely consistent duty approach to morality which expunges every element of advantage from ethics and makes it completely a matter of selfless obedience to duty with no value placed on happiness as a moral justification had to wait for the time of Immanuel Kant. That was his contribution to ethics. In this respect, Kant's ethics is the sacrifice pro-duty element of Plato, the Stoics, and Christianity stripped of every mitigating Greek feature. The Stoics, however, are not nearly as consistent or as corrupt as Kant. No Greek, however bad he became, ever dreamed of approaching the man-destroying evil later adopted and proclaimed by Kant and his followers. Well, now, what are your duties in, in their content, according to the Stoics? Well, their basic answer is live in accordance with your nature, with your reason which is a typically Greek answer. But, of course, your nature is to be a fragment. And therefore, what your reason tells you is nothing like what the other schools said. I'll mention two characteristic Stoic duties, which in their opinion are commandments of human reason. Number one, the duty of acceptance. Accept whatever happens to you without wanting it to be different. Do not burn with passion for the things you haven't got. Do not feel anger or rebellion or protest against the state of affairs you're in or the kind of world you're in or the social circumstances you're in. Take the course of events as it comes, yield unprotestingly to whatever occurs. 
Do not lead events as it goes, as the saying goes, but follow them. Why this as a duty? Well, to protest would be impious. It would be rebellion against God, since everything is part of his plan. And, of course, remember also the teleology. Everything is for the best. So if your wife gets run over by a truck, if you could see it all from God's point of view, you would see that it's all for the best, and therefore it's senseless to get upset over. And anyway, everything is inevitable. Your wife has been run over an infinite number of times by that same truck. <laughs> so it's ridiculous. And then, of course, there is what you can call the Grand Canyon argument. Although that isn't uh, the name that the Stoics gave to it. <laughs> but that's the idea. Look at the vastness of the universe, the enormous number of events in the huge span of eternity. What does your particular life and petty cares matter in the face of this? That's what I call the Grand Canyon argument because people usually recite it when they see the Grand Canyon. <laughs> Now, all of these reasons, the wise man will tranquilly accept everything. And that's, of course, what we mean by a stoic today when you call somebody stoical. He will see that everything is inevitable, that all's for the best, that nothing external is worth having anyway, that so long as he does his duty and accepts, he has everything worth having, inner tranquility, wisdom, or virtue. To achieve this state, of course, he must constantly will down the enemy, his passions. He must discipline himself. He must see how his desires and aversions are simply nonsense in the face of God's inevitable unfolding. And if he schools himself in this, says the Stoics, one day, if he's really steeped himself in the right metaphysics and the right self-discipline, in a sudden conversion, all of his emotions will fall away from him, and he will be truly insensible. Now, it's hard to do this. It takes a process of constant willpower and self-discipline. But given enough time, they thought it can be done. Once you do it, you are truly invulnerable. Now you value only what's in your power. Only uh, the state of doing your duty i.e. virtue. That is really, in the last analysis, the only thing worth having if you're to be secure and independent of the world. Thus, the idea, which we know in the expression, virtue is an end in itself. Virtue is its own reward. Everything else is inconsequential. Life, wealth, health, fame, you name it. And you see the similarity to Epicurus in this withdrawal except that the Stoic withdrawal from life is much greater than Epicurus's. Epicurus withdraws into a garden. The Stoic withdraws into his own soul, where nothing can touch him, into being virtuous as an end in itself, simply for the sake of doing his duty. That, he thinks, is just up to him alone, not dependent on a hostile world. And therefore, we have an even greater renunciation of life than we did with Epicurus. Now, besides the duty of acceptance, there is a second duty I'll mention, uh, and that is, uh, we'll conclude our discussion of the Stoic duties. So far, uh, via acceptance, complete passivity in action would be sufficient. Simply wipe out your emotions, keep yourself attuned to God's plan, don't uh, desire or protest, be apathetic. And a few advocated a kind of passive state of this sort. But most of the Stoics gave a positive content to your duty, requiring definite action and not simply passive acceptance. What kind of action did they advocate? Altruistic action. Serving others. Doing your duty to promote the welfare of mankind. What was their reasoning here? Well, again, they based it on the idea you're just a part of a whole. Just as you're a part of God and not metaphysically autonomous and therefore have duties to God and should not seek your own advantage, so in relation to mankind, you're only a part. In relation to you, mankind is a much larger fragment of God. <clears throat> and by the same reasoning that the whole is superior to the part, you owe an allegiance to humanity. And besides, of course, it's hopeless to achieve any advantages for yourself in this world 
As a Stoic, you are insensible. So no personal self-interest or private goals are possible anyway. If you're not to vegetate, all that's left is service to others. And here I'll give you a quote from Epictetus. Quote. They use always the bodily analogies. Quote. A foot, for instance, I will allow it as natural should be clean. But if you take it as a foot, and as a thing which does not stand by itself, it will be seen it, if need be, to walk in the mud, to tread on thorns, and sometimes even to be cut off for the benefit of the whole body. Else, it is no longer a foot. In some such way, we should conceive of ourselves also. What art thou? A man. Looked at standing by thyself and separate, it is natural for thee, in health and wealth, long to live. But looked at as a man, and only as a part of a whole, it is for that whole sake that thou shouldst at one time fall sick, at another brave the perils of the sea, again know the meaning of want, and perhaps die an early death. Why then repine? Knowest thou not that as the foot is no more a foot if detached from the body, so thou in like case are no longer a man. Unquote from uh, Epictetus. And one more, which makes the point very clear from Epictetus, quote, What then does the character of a citizen imply? <laughs> to hold no private interest, to deliberate of nothing as a separate individual, but rather like the hand or the foot, which, if they had reason and comprehended the constitution of nature, would never pursue or desire but with a reference to the whole. Hence the philosophers rightly say that if it were possible for a wise and good man to foresee what was to happen, he might cooperate in bringing on himself sickness and death and mutilation, being sensible that these things are appointed in the order of the universe and that the whole is superior to a part and the city to the citizen. Unquote. Now that is certainly unequivocal. Now, of course, the ground and essence of this viewpoint is in Plato. Uh, as we saw in Plato's organic theory of the state. But in Plato, to some serious extent, moral virtue was justified by the happiness it would lead to. You remember Plato, uh, although he was very mixed on this question, his argument against the sophists was, if you behave your way, you will be miserable, you'll have a sick soul. Now, however, the openly religious metaphysics of the Stoics combined with the deep sense of futility about the achievement of any personal goals on earth, has led for the first time to altruism as an official cardinal explicit duty, not to be justified even in the name of your own long-run self-interest. Now, I, I hasten to point out that the Stoics, as always, are inconsistent on this point. They often said that altruism leads to your own happiness, but that is not their uh, distinctive uh, viewpoint. That's simply their Greek legacy. Now, I should point out that the Stoics, even though they advocated altruism, are often accused with some validity of really down deep being egoists. And the argument is as follows. The Stoics are really primarily motivated by the desire to achieve a sense of their personal, individual, moral virtue. They don't really sympathize with others in trouble, i.e., they don't burn with pity or love for suffering mankind. Since they're Stoics, they remain emotionally aloof, cold, uninvolved, apathetic. What then is their real interest in helping others? Well, the critics answer, to give the Stoic a chance to exercise his moral muscle. In effect, to do what's duty and thus gain the selfish sense that he has been virtuous. So their real goal is selfish after all. Now, this argument is valid. It simply shows that even the most Platonist Greeks had some tie to reality and to reason. If you contrast this Stoic approach with the later Kantian approach, you will see that point, because on Kant's view, if you are motivated even by the desire to achieve a sense of your own virtue, that fact alone deprives you of all moral credit for your action because you still have a personal egoistic desire. If you get this contrast, you'll see how comparatively innocent any Greek, including even the Stoics, were 
uh, on these points. And one final point on the Stoic ethics. As is typical of any duty approach to morality, the Stoics stress the importance of motive, your inner motive, as the measure of your morality, rather than your actual achievements in action in the world. All duty moralities, of whatever kind, hold that since morality has no existential goal or reward, but consists in selfless obedience to duty, the essence of the moral man is his inner compliance with virtue, and that his attainments in actual reality are secondary or unimportant. Now, those of you who know Kant will recognize how deeply he was influenced by the centuries of Stoicism and Christianity on this point. Of course, from an Aristotelian, non-duty viewpoint, this emphasis on the primacy of motive is a fundamental error, because on a non-duty viewpoint, you'll say, the purpose of morality is to achieve some goal in action in the world, whether happiness or life or whatever it happens to be. And you'll say the moral man is the one who acts in the right way to achieve this end in actual fact. His motives are important only because motives lead to action. So you will give primacy to action. But on a duty approach, you'll reverse the order of priorities and say, it's not what you actually do in life that's so important, but your inner allegiance to duty, your motive. And action is important only as an expression of the right motive. Now, this idea of the primacy of motive over action is typically Stoic and has been highly influential on subsequent ethics, particularly the Christian Kantian schools, as I'm sure you can see. In general, to sum up their ethics, the Stoics preached an ascetic morality, with dutiful, altruistic insensibility as the essence of the good life. For the record, you are allowed three emotions. Joy at the beauty of the universe, as a testament to God's goodness. Hope to become virtuous. Fear of becoming vicious. As you see, this is hardly what you could describe as an extensive emotional life. Now let us say a word in conclusion about the Stoics' distinctive approach to politics. Because on this issue, the Stoics did have one crucial contribution to make. They were the first major school in Western philosophy to grasp and to preach what we can call the metaphysical equality of all men. And I'm using that concept roughly as I explained it in the question period one or two lectures ago. The Stoics held that all men, not only males, or Greeks, or philosophers, but all men have some share in reason. That all men are members of the same species, and that as such, each individual has a certain metaphysical dignity and value, simply qua human, and therefore potentially rational, being. Every human being they held is to this extent entitled to respect as a human being. And politically, he is entitled to equality before the law. All men, in essence, have certain rights, which others may not morally infringe. Slavery of any kind is wrong. And if they went on, the particular country you live in has laws decreeing that some men are second-class citizens or not citizens at all or are slaves. In other words, that some men have no rights. This is a violation of the proper principles of law, which should treat all men equally. Above the laws of the state, Said the Stoics, there are the laws based on reality, the laws of nature, the so-called natural laws. And that was their major political contribution. The only proper country is a country in which the actual laws reflect the natural laws. And those natural laws are universal, applicable to all men, rational, absolute, eternal, unvarying, moral. If the laws of your country conflict with the natural laws, then the moral man is the man who gives his allegiance to the natural law, not to the law of his country. Now, the importance of these doctrines to the subsequent development of the theory of individual rights, constitutional government, and the United States of America can hardly be overemphasized. I don't think I need to emphasize this point because uh, I think you can grasp its crucial importance. The Stoics do get the credit for being the first major school to grasp this cardinal political principle. I must add, however, 
that in their context it was deeply intertwined with their religious metaphysics and altruist ethics. Their basic grounds for asserting the metaphysical equality of man and the importance of what they called natural law, the basic grounds were not natural, but actually supernatural. All men are fragments of God, they reasoned. Therefore, all men are metaphysically brothers, in a literal sense. They're all offspring of the same divine father. And it is because of this, and because God has ordained the natural laws, that all men should be treated equally. All men, as they put it, are members of one city, the cosmic city, the cosmopolis. Get the idea? Cosmopolitan. And hence, all men have certain rights. And since they said your primary duty is to serve your brothers, you shouldn't enslave him, but live for him. You see, so they shouldn't be slaves. Now, you see the terribly tragic mistaken mixture here. The basis of what later became an individualist politics, but tied to a supernaturalist metaphysics and an altruist ethics. And this mixture, of course, has subsisted to this day in the so-called conservative movement. Now, I trust that this audience knows the disaster of this combination, so I won't rehearse those points tonight. The fact, of course, is that a mystical defense of rights ultimately leads to the destruction of rights. In exactly the same way, for the same reasons as Plato's mystic defense of concepts, ultimately led in modern philosophy, as we'll see, to the destruction of concepts. A mystic defense is worse than no defense. It is self-defeating. And, of course, that's the supernaturalism. As for the altruism, well, that I trust this audience understands fully how it is incompatible with the principle of rights or of man's metaphysical equality. Here again, the Stoics represent the other side of the coin from the Sophists. They share the same basic view of egoism. The Sophists say the egoist tramples over others. The Stoics say, true enough, but you should be an altruist sacrificing for others. And only in that way can you respect the rights of others. So altruism became tied to the defense of individual rights with disastrous results. Despite these uh, terrible errors, however, the Stoics still do get credit for advancing the first germs of what was later to be a profoundly important political development. What is the current method used by determinists to grapple with the problem of freedom and morality? Well, the method, which goes back a few centuries, is called soft determinism. There's two types of determinists today, hard determinists and soft determinists. The name was given by William James, who was himself an indeterminist. Uh, and he thought that soft determinists were, in effect, soft in the head, uh, which, about which he is correct. And therefore, he gave the name as a pejorative term, but it's stuck, and it's now used technically. A soft determinist is anybody, in essence, who says determinism and morality are perfectly compatible. How do they get that? Well, as follows. Morality, they say, is one of the factors that will determine people in the future. If we have moral uh, injunctions and we say to people, you should do this and you shouldn't do that, the very advocacy of those views becomes one of the determining factors which will shape human behavior. So everything is necessitated. Nothing could happen differently. But by promoting certain moral ideas and repudiating others, we thereby uh, uh, take onto ourselves the power to determine the future of humanity. Needless to say, a soft determinist will say, yes, I grant you, I myself had no choice but to advocate what I advocate. But uh, such is determinism, and that doesn't bother me, he'll say. Now, they say, we must, however, make a big, dis big distinction. For instance, take the theory of punishment. When we punish someone, which we justify in our soft determinist grounds that the punishment will have good consequences, we're not punishing him in the name of retribution for his past uh, crimes. Retribution, they grant, would be unfair because, after all, the person couldn't help what he did. He had no choice. What, then, is the justification of punishment? It's desirable social consequences. You punish an individual if, for instance, you thereby deter him or others 
from engaging in antisocial behavior, as they would put it. Or you punish him in order to rehabilitate him. Or you punish him to remove him from harming others. In other words, the justification of punishment is, quote, utilitarian. That is to say, it's concerned with the benefits on society. And they say society is more important than the individual. And therefore, we have two contrasting theories of punishment, the so-called retributive theory and the utilitarian theory. The retributive theory, characteristically held by free willists, says that you should punish a man only if he volitionally committed a crime, in which case the justification of the punishment is justice, retribution, paying him back for what he did. The uh, soft determinist says this is unfair because no one had any choice about what they did. The justification of punishment is its utilitarian social consequences. This, of course, leads them to monstrous problems, uh, not the least of which is what is wrong then with punishing an innocent man who has done nothing whatever if you can show that it leads to desirable social consequences. And uh, soft determinists try every kind of trick to get out of that and 15 other equivalent type of objections, but they are the, that is the full collectivist, altruist mentality that cannot conceive of the individual as the unit in ethics, and so it's open to all of the objections to collectivism. How do you reconcile free will with causality? In essence, very simply. You do not equate causality with mechanism. Causality, as uh, implied by Aristotle and as explicitly endorsed by objectivism, states that everything that happens, happens as a result of the nature of the acting entity. And given an entity with a certain nature, in a certain set of circumstances, it can only perform one type of action. This, as a metaphysical proposition, does not yet state what kinds of entities there are, or what kinds of actions they can perform. It leaves that question wide open as a metaphysics. Now, if you have an independent proof that man has volition, that he does have choice, and uh, I assume you f you're familiar with the objectivist view that man's direct area of choice is whether to focus his mind or not, to think or not, and that everything else is a causal consequence of that choice. But assuming now there's an independent proof of that, that is in no way a violation of the law of cause and effect. A certain type of entity, namely man, under certain circumstances, namely he's sane, grown up, uh, past a certain age, he's conscious and awake, etc., has an undamaged brain and so on, has only one action possible to him, namely to choose. And that is the type of action that he has. And he must perform it. It is causally necessitated. Uh, the proof of the inescapability of it and the causal necessity of choice is the plaints of the existentialists who go around bewailing the fact that they can't get around choosing. It's caused, you see. Choosing is cause. But now, since it's choice we're talking about, that means the selection of alternatives as a self-generating entity without being necessitated to one alternative rather than the other. In a word, choice is a subspecies of caused action and is in no way incompatible with or in violation with, uh, of uh, the principle of causality, if you understand causality in the Aristotelian and not in the mechanistic, atomistic uh, sense of the term. Discuss the Stoic answers to the problem of evil. Well, here's five that I noted down. To begin with, nothing is really evil because you should be apathetic toward everything. You should understand that the only thing that's really good is virtue. And therefore, uh, in that respect, there's no point in uh, worrying about the problem. There is no real evil except what you yourself are responsible for, namely vice. Now, of course, this raised to the Stoics, uh, the critics of the Stoics quickly hastened to say, well, if nothing is really good or evil, why are you should, are you should you be in such a rush to provide these unimportant things to other people? In other words, if, for instance, health is unimportant, why put yourself out to foster other people's health, which you should do as an altruist, according to the Stoics? 
If money is unimportant and it's not really good, why bother to give it to other people, etc.? Well, the Stoic answer to that was a really petty, word-chopping distinction. They said it's true that nothing is really good or evil, except virtue, of course, and vice, <coughs> but certain things are advantageous and others are not, and you should therefore strive to give the advantages to other people even though they're not really good. Well, of course, the question is, is the advantageous really good or not? And uh, their opponents had a lot of fun with them. <laughs> Another point the Stoics made, since they weren't committed to official uh, dogmatic view of God, is that God was limited. In effect, he's doing the best he can, but he's got a dirty job. <laughs> Another point that they made was, if there was no evil, we'd have no opportunity for virtue. The essence of virtue is acceptance. And if uh, your wife was never run over, you'd never have a real chance to show how virtuous you were. <laughs> Another uh, somewhat better point they made was, after all, God works through necessary causal laws. A world of laws is much better than a world without laws. But a world which has natural laws has to function accordingly. And if the natural laws result in the lava trickling down on the Italian village, there's no way out of that situation. If God suspends the law, it would be worse still, because then we'd be living in a chaotic world. Now this, you see, is a better point, much better point. The only problem with it is it takes law outside the province of God. If you then combine that with the fact that law is inherent in the nature of existence, you destroy the whole possibility of a God with any power at all, because everything happens then by the nature of existence. So that's a good argument, but it ruins God. <laughs> Another one is the so-called author analogy. If you wrote a novel, and you put a villain in it, and you were one of the characters in the story, from your point of view, the villain is a very bad thing. But from the point of view of the reader of the story as a whole, the villain adds spice, drama, conflict, value in the same way. From you are actors, so to speak, in God's play. From your limited point of view, if somebody sticks a knife in your back, that's evil. But if you could see the whole play, including the final act, you would see that it's a much better story that way. <laughs> now, unfortunately, you cannot see the whole play. So that comes back to the point that if only you could see everything from God's point of view, you would see that it's, e that it's all good. I may say the same reasoning can be used in reverse and was in the medieval period. There were people who said, we believe everything is evil. Everything has an evil purpose. Now it seems that some things are good, but that is simply a snare set by the devil to trap man and prevent him from committing suicide so the devil can torture him longer. Now, the logic of that argument is exactly the same as the other side uh, and has nothing more to recommend it. The facts are some things are good and others are not, and you cannot escape that fact. Who was the father of individual rights? Well, I'll give you five different answers. Aristotle, by laying the metaphysics of the reality of the individual. The Stoics, by being the first to grasp the metaphysical equality of all men. John Locke, by being the most influential definer of the concept of individual inalienable rights to life, liberty, property. George Washington and the founding fathers who started the first country to grasp and be implemented on the principle of individual rights. Ayn Rand, who was the first one to give a complete philosophic system from metaphysics and most crucially in this context, ethics validating the concept, those five.